to welcome all of you tonight in, in Jesus' name. It means very much to us that you're all here. Particularly that you're here in one accord. We don't ever want to take this for granted, Amen. brother. Amen. Some people uh, don't have this. That would like that would like to have it. We welcome also those of who are with us on live stream. We enjoy your fellowship, and those of you who often make comments during these sessions, we do appreciate your fellowship. This will be our 42nd exposition of the book of Amos. We're going to be in the 7th chapter, verses 10 through 13. <clears throat> now, it's important to remember this, that as long as the world stands, the truth of God is going to be opposed and contradicted. Even when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, Ezekiel tells us in the 40th chapter, 40th chapter, there'll be some marshy places that aren't healed. The world not only tends to obscure the truth, I, I, you'll learn this. There's certain involvements of the world we all have to have. But even those have an obscuring effect. Yeah. I'm going to talk about legitimate things now. Mm -hmm. Even legitimate involvements with the world have kind of a dulling effect yeah, right. uh -huh. on your mind concerning the things of God. Uh -huh. Now, God's given us a means to recuperate the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's called the renewing of the Holy Spirit. But that condition does exist. Because the world is a, is a domain, it's a whole, it's like a world within a world yeah. where there's hostility and aggression against the truth. Now this takes place in two different spheres, this aggression against the truth. Two different spheres. One is inside you. <coughs> it's called another law. I see another law. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and death. You got to deal with things you would to God you didn't have to deal with. Amen. But that's one. Yeah. You're like our walking cosmos. It has this within? Then there's is the world at large with all of its lusts and things that pertain to this world. And it's wisdom, chiefly it's wisdom. The world is filled with erroneous wisdom, lusts, and desires. You can't get away from them. They're, if you're in the world, you're subject to the eroding effect of these things. Yet you have to fight <laughs> to keep your head above water. you got to... You have to fight. The wisdom of the world is not just different. It's more than that. The wisdom of the world is hostile and aggressive against the wisdom of God. <laughs> Those who have been reconciled unto God see the world's wisdom in that light. <coughs> God calls the whole panorama of worldly wisdom foolishness yeah. Yeah. now it's foolishness when compared to the knowledge that extends on to eternal life he's not saying that it's foolish to have you know the various medical fields and all this that's not what he's saying mm -hmm. saying when it comes to you and god it doesn't make any difference what the world gives you it's foolish yeah. Yeah. doesn't have anything not one ounce of anything to contribute to you and your identity with the God of heaven. And we got to learn that now. Amen. Some people don't believe this. Yeah. They dabble too much in the world. They don't believe this. Mm -hmm. But you have to believe it. 
And the world never agrees with God. If the world, for instance, pursues the origin of man, it comes up with a completely different answer than God does. If the world attempts to define righteousness and right and wrong, it comes up with a completely different definition than God does. Whatever the world deals with that God has dealt with, they're never in accord. Never. It's never in harmony. When the world speaks upon the things of God, regardless of its motive, it stirs up trouble and distraction. James said of the world's wisdom, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Then it talks about its fruit. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. That's what's in the wake of the world's wisdom. Amen. Now, our text is going to be an example of this kind of hostility. Amos 7, verses 10 through 13. God, I mean, Amos has just prophesied that God's going to rise up against with the with a sword against the house of Jeroboam, who was then king. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it's the king's chapel, and it's the king's court. That was in a religious setting. That was among the people of God. That was not in Babylon. That wasn't in Mesopotamia. That wasn't in Egypt. This was among the people of God. Boy, that's a startling thing to think on, isn't it? <laughs> not once we're exposed to a foe. Who is this foe? It's someone in the house. The foe. And he rises up when he hears, hears the words of the man of God. Now, all you have to do to get some relief is shut up. Yeah, that's right. Just keep silence, and these folk won't bother you. Yeah. So I'm telling you the truth. They won't. Mm -hmm. They won't object to the way you live. Yeah. They won't say, See here, we don't like how you're living. They won't do this when you talk yeah. that's when the trouble rises those who are not of God are agitated by straightforward proclamations of the men and women of God Amen. so some people put their tongue in their cheek modify their sayings try and be polite don't say things you know will hurt people you know and they, they cave in but Amos didn't he didn't cave in. Jesus, for example, he never brushed conflict aside as though it was nothing. If you didn't listen to Jesus, when he talked in your presence, he didn't overlook it. Yeah, that's right. Mm. See, our church does today. Yeah. They'll pay, oh, pass over it. Every man for himself. Jesus never, never glossed it. Let me give you a couple of examples he said to a multitude that was listening, but they weren't listening, Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. That's how he talked. This is the Son of God. Yeah. Amen. 
Here's something else he said. He that is of God heareth the words of God. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. See, I'm showing you here how that when the conflict's there, men of God face it. Yeah, amen. Head on. Mm -hmm. They don't back enough of this pussyfoot religion. Yeah. I've really had my fill of it, and I don't want any more of it. I don't like compromisers. I don't respect compromisers, and it's an awful hard for me to love them. You gotta be perfectly honest about <laughs> about this, because I see the damage that it does. Now I understand that Jesus knew all things, and He can speak like this, and we don't know all things, so we have to be cautious. I understand that, but my point is that this contradiction still exists. Some see it, some don't. But those who see it, if they don't know how to react. They really need to ask God to help them to react. Now we're introduced to Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. It said of Jeroboam, to whom Amaziah now is going to address his words, he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Well, <laughs> Amaziah was one of those priests. Again, it said of him, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whosoever would be consecrated, whosoever he would, he consecrated, and he became one of the, and he became one of the priests of the high places. Now, I hesitate to say this, but I do have to say this. The most ignorant people I've ever encountered about the things of God have been in Bible college. I'm just telling you the truth now. It's because somebody let the lowest echelon of spiritual people into this institution. Now, it didn't used to be this way. But this is the way it is now. They are so eager to have a large populace that it's hard to find a genuine Christian. And churches are doing the same thing. So they can fill up the pews they spend so much money buying and auditoriums and buildings they spent fortunes erecting they're letting all kind of people come in that are of the lowest rank. And they're not people that want to get out of the lower. Yeah. See, I'm showing you that this problem has existed from a long time, which means this is a strategy Satan has promoted. This is the only way you, see, Jeroboam didn't start this in our age, but the same person that started it in him is still doing it. Yeah. So this is one of the priests that he ordained. And it's also said of this less than ideal king, Jeroboam, he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David, his father. Now there's several instances of men in scripture who were not at all alike, but had the same name. Like the, what I just read was of the another Jeroboam. They have the same name, but there are different characteristics. You'll find this in the Bible quite often. You find men the same name, but they're different. Like, like Ananias, who lied to the Holy Spirit, another Ananias, who was sent by God to mm -hmm. yeah. sanctify Paul. Then you got. Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed Jesus, and Judas, the son of Alphaeus, and both of these were apostles. See, so you got this situation. But this particular Amaziah here, who the, another king bore his name, who wasn't an ideal king, but he did do better than some. This particular Amaziah was a priest of Bethel. That's where a golden calf had been located for Israel to worship. Jeremiah referred to Bethel as Bethel, their confidence. Boy, that, <laughs> yeah. 
They were trusted. They were trusted in this physical location where an idol was. Hosea also referred to the judgment of Bethel. Already Amos has referred to this citadel of idolatry five times. Bethel, he's mentioned it five times. And he'll do so once more. Here at Bethel, there was an empty imitation of worship. They went through all the mechanizations of worship, but it was all for nothing. It never got off the earth. It never entered into heaven. God never recognized it. It was just an exercise in vanity. Now, the devil doesn't mind whether people do this in Buddhism or Muslim religion or the Christian religion. As long as it's just a lot of baloney, he doesn't care. If it doesn't up, get up to God, well, it's more than it just didn't get up to God. Uh -huh. It puts your soul to sleep. Yes. Oh, people got people that are addicted to dead church services uh -huh. and this sort of thing. They got to recognize this. It puts your soul to sleep. Yes. Amen. You'll be agitated for a while, but pretty soon you won't yes. be as agitated yes. as you were before. You doze off spiritually. Yes. that are going to say we did many mighty That's works. That's right. Mm. Now yeah. Amaziah is going to speak to this king. He says um, Amos you know that fellow Amos he's conspired against you. Amos words were the words of God. God himself said, In the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be weighed, laid waste, and I will ri rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. That's what God said. Amaziah said, Amos has raised a conspiracy against you. Like something like Barabbas did to Rome. Rather than heeding the words of Amos, Amaziah turned it into a political situation. Yeah, yeah. Our country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Yeah. Oh, he wasn't the last person that did that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Turned it into a political. You can't take the salvation of God and transfer it to the United States of America and don't try and do it. Yeah, right. It yeah. won't transfer. Yeah. Because this is a, this is a kingdom God's kingdom is going to roll over. Uh -huh, it's yeah. just temporary. We accept what good things are here uh -huh. and what God's allowed us to have here. We accept them. We don't worship this country. Amen. Amen. Right. We're not citizens here. No. Right. <laughs> Some other versions he raised a conspiracy against you. Say he plot he plotted against you. Yeah. He's rebelled against you. He's hatching a plot against yeah. you. And, Living Bible says Amos is a traitor to our nation. Boy, that'll that'll yeah. that'll t t take him off right there. And where's he doing this? In the in the midst of Israel. He's not doing this privately uh -huh. like David Koresh did. Yeah. He's doing this publicly. Yeah. That's what this is the charge now brought against Amos. Among the people of Israel, in the very heart of the kingdom. Remember, there was a secret plot hats for Jesus. But Amaziah said, this is a public plot. He's, he's doing this right out in the open. And the land isn't able to bear all his words. <laughs> yeah. Other versions say they're unable to endure them or the land's trouble. Or the land isn't capable of, isn't able to cope with everything. What he's saying is, this is pushing the people to anarchy. We got yeah. something bad's going to happen here because of what he's saying. Yeah. There's going to be some kind of insurrection happen, agitation. The government's going to fall apart because of these words. We got got to step in and do something about it. However, the message of Amos is really one designed to prepare the people for the judgment that was coming. Yeah. And here's a man of the world who's guy disguised as a priest. 
And he says this is a threat. This is a threat. This was a, th this was a prophecy, not a, just a, not a vain threat. Uh -huh. And it was designed to get the people ready. Now let's look at what Amaziah said. Very interesting. Thus saith Amos, I'm going to quote him, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of, his own, out of their own land. That's, that's what's going on, king. Now, a false prophet, first of all, is a prophet God didn't send. Yeah. That's, what, that's what a false prophet is. It's a prophet God didn't send. That's first. What he says is after that. First thing is God didn't send him. Now, Jeremiah, to, to Jeremiah, God defined, kind of defined what a false prophet was. He said, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them. Neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. I take those off to you. That's what a false prophet is. Now, academically, you could not ask for a more technically correct saying than what's right there, what he said. Let me give you an example of a technically correct saying that wasn't right. It concerns this uh, incident when Paul confronted a woman who had the spirit of divination. And the woman with the spirit of divination shouts out, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. As I said, academically, you, you can't. You can't be more correct than that. Mm -hmm. That's precise. That's exactly true, academically speaking. Mm -hmm. But let's apply the test of Jeremiah to her. Mm -hmm. God didn't send her. Yeah. God didn't command her. Mm -hmm. God didn't speak to her. Mm -hmm. She prophesied a divination. Yeah. Yeah. Right? This is what an evil spirit told her, not what God told her. Mm -hmm. She prophesied something that was of naught or worthless, mm -hmm. and she prophesied the deceit of the heart mm -hmm. or something cooked up. Yet it sounded like it was right. Mm -hmm. Now, brothers and sisters, some people quote John 3.16 that are just like that woman with the spirit of divination. And others quote Acts 2.38. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But they're not people God's spoken to. They're not people God has shown something to. Mm -hmm. They're institutional people on the surface. They're the devil's children underneath. Mm -hmm. Amen. Add to this the fact that she wasn't speaking with the right intention. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've got to speak for the right reason. Amen. Someone who speaks for the wrong reason is not from God no matter what they said no matter how much they quoted mm -hmm. from the Bible her objectives this woman of spirit of divination were not in sync with God's objective therefore she was, she was false mm -hmm. <laughs> now if you wonder if there are still people speaking that have a different objective than God now, gird up the loins of your mind and listen to about one hour of Christian TV. Yeah. And it won't be long. Yeah. You'll hear somebody that announces their objectives and it's not God's objective. Yeah. Some people's objective is better homes. Uh -huh. yeah. Sounds noble, doesn't it? Huh? Sounds noble, doesn't it? But Jesus said, what? Well, if you follow me, some of your foes will be those of your own household. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we want harmonious and godly homes. Mm -hmm. But we're not stupid. Mm -hmm. Jesus has said this isn't guaranteed. If you've got one, you give thanks for it. Because yeah. not everybody does. Yeah. That's just one instance. Some other will say, now, we got to reach the world. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, doesn't it? 
That isn't anything Jesus said or God said. Jesus says, preach the gospel to every creature. That's not the same as win everybody. Just in case you wondered. It's not the same thing. What I'm showing here that the world, when it handles the truth of God, are like Amaziah. They put a little different spin on it. Now let's see how he twisted, how he actually twisted what Amos said. He said, Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. But that's not what Amos said at all. Here's what, here's what uh, Amos said, that God would rise a sword against the house. I said against the house of Jeroboam. Now that prophecy was fulfilled when the son of Jeroboam, who was Zechariah, and he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, the son, not Jeroboam, the son of Jeroboam. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. That's 2 Kings 15.10. So that fulfilled Amos' prophecy, but that wasn't a prophecy against Jeroboam. In fact, of Jeroboam's death, it says, Jeroboam slept with his fathers, which indicates he died a natural death. He, did, he wasn't killed at all so see that but he twisted that word yeah, that's right. he changed it from house of jeroboam to jeroboam yeah. that's very subtle but it, it wasn't right it means this indicates that amos word were fulfilled and amaziah's yeah. fell to the ground all this accents something for those who are in christ it's imperative that they know and are acquainted with the purpose of God. Yeah, amen. This is imperative. Yeah. There has been too much ignorance about the purpose of God. Not many people talk about it. Mm -hmm. right. Some of you never heard about it till a few years back. Amen. The purpose of God. Now, there's a lot in the Bible about it, yeah. but uh -huh. I'll tell you, there's not, many, there's not much said about it these days, about the purpose of God. But until you know the purpose of God, don't be doing a lot of talking mm -hmm. in the name of the Lord. Not even down to the quote in the scripture, because you may be quoting the wrong one. Now there's kind of a summary overview of his purpose in Romans 8, 29 to 30. Whom the Lord foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to be conformed to the image of his son, whom he predestinated, then he called, and he called, justified, be justified, he glorified. See, that's kind of a boiled down statement of God's purpose. You have to know that now before you do the work of the Lord. You have to know it to some degree. I mean, I'm not saying you have to have perfect understanding, but you kind of have to know where God's going yeah, yeah. with this. If you want to look at it from another perspective, the purpose, mm -hmm. Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. So that's kind of a one-sentence one statement about what God's doing. Jesus is bringing, he's getting them out of the world into yeah. the presence of the Lord. See, that's what he's doing. Uh, one more, this is a statement of purpose now. See, see, Amaziah couldn't speak from the standpoint of God's purpose. See, God revealed his purpose to Amos. He, he didn't reveal it to Amaziah. Even after he heard it, he didn't know it. <laughs> from another viewpoint, Jesus is preparing the church to present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Or he's preparing it to be a chaste virgin who will become his bride who has prepared herself. Yeah. That, that's what God's doing. Yeah. Now, if you, were to, if you were to take that purpose... Put it in some, maybe in your own words some way, and ask anybody on the street, anybody, do you think this is what the church is doing? I don't think you will find a soul that will say, yeah, I, I can see it. 
I may be wrong. I'd like to be wrong. But just give it a try. In fact, if you really want to try, try it on some church people. The point I'm making here is that in order to be a spokesman for God, you have to know what God is doing. Some of the details you might not know, but you've got to know how the thing's going to end up. You've got to know what the end objective is. What is this all about? Get out of here and get into there. That's what it's all about. And if you've got a message that tailors people to fit in here, well, do we really have to say anything more? If God's objective is to take out a people for his name, then woe to the person who's trying to Make a people for his name here. And Amos said, Amaziah said, Israel shall surely be taken away. Well, this was stated several times. God did indeed say, Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. Amos 5.5. 5. He said, Israel will go into captivity beyond Damascus. Amos 5.27. He said to their leaders, therefore now they shall go captive, Amos 6, 7. He said the city of Samaria be delivered, he'll deliver up the city and all therein, Amos 6, 7, and 8. And later God will say through Amos, Israel shall surely go into captivity, Amos 7, 17. So Amos did say that. Let's see what this prelude that Amaziah made. He's had a conspiracy against yeah. you. Or that made this sound mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> completely different. Yeah. Yeah, the false prophet made this a personal, a yeah. personal attack on yeah, the kids. That's right. that's right. And we know how people in power react to things oh, like that. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. You notice that Amaziah didn't have the same reaction as Amos. When he heard about this, he said, Oh, Lord, forgive. Yeah, that's here right. He's Amen. pointing the finger and saying he's the one doing it. Amen. He didn't take any of the blame. Amen. And brother, you have to remember that even in Jonah, he gave a very negative message, and that was accepted. Yeah, that's the only kind of message he gave. That's the only kind of message he gave. Yeah, here yeah. it's just completely rejected. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there was there wasn't a good note in anything Jonah said, but the king figured it out. Oh, maybe if we repent. So just the king had more sense than most. <laughs> that's right. Amen. Yeah. And he said, and the city was saved. Yeah. The city was saved. This is this kind of speaking. Amos is a traitor. Jesus would say it this way: "They speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake." That's that's how he'd say it. Or Peter would say, "Reproached for the name of Christ." See, that's that's how he. So this sort of thing, or sort of thing, still goes on. And you do it in the midst of Israel, and it's right on your doorstep or right under your nose. A secret plot. The land's not able to bear it. Things are being set up, King, so we're going to have anarchy. We're going to have some kind of uprising. It's this a land can't stand this kind of message. But the message of Amos was largely one designed to prepare the people. Now, as I said, Amaziah twists what uh, Amos has said. Yeah. And he forgets this one thing that in these prophecies that should be taken away captive, uh -huh. in every one of them, God first of all told him why this was going to take place. Right. Yeah. He told him why it was going to take place, spelled it out to him, told him their sins. But Amaziah didn't make any reference to this at all. He, apparently, he obviously hadn't been warning the people. He'd been living right in the middle of this hodgepodge himself and contributing to it. He'd not lifted a word about that. Oh, God's not pleased with this. We shouldn't be doing it. See, he didn't do that. Now, the fact that he didn't do that discounted everything he said. Discounted it. He's a false prophet. You discount what men like that say, even though it may sound good. All about Amaziah, he's not done yet. He's going to talk to Amos. He said to Amos, Amos, thou seer. Sarcasm, see? thou seer. <laughs> In other words, and say, you who sees things, you visionary, you prophets, you. 
Good News Bible says, that's enough, prophet. See, it was sarcasm. Yeah. Not complimentary words. He's mocking. He's mocking yeah. Amos. Yeah, right. Now, Amos says, thus saith the Lord. Three, 43 times in the book of Amos. He said that, thus saith the Lord, 43 times in that book, this book, he says that. Four times he says, the Lord God showed me. <coughs> Join that Amos guarded himself so you know where this message came from. The words God and Lord occur 78 times in Amos. That, that, that's, what was, that's his premier insight. There's no question about it. Amos declared the message he confessed came from God. However, this made no difference to Amaziah. It didn't sound good. He wouldn't receive it. Didn't make any difference who gave it. God gave it or who. He just rejected it. He rejected Amos and what he said about Israel. I continues. He says, flee to the land of Judah. That's where Amos is from, Judah. Another version say, flee to the land of Judah, go back, draw, go in flight, run away, remove the, get out of here, withdraw. See, take your visions and get out. Go back to Judah. Amos was originally among the herdmen of Tekoa. Yeah. Tekoa was right close to Bethlehem in Jerusalem, which was in Judea. So his native, the native, his native land was Ju Judea, uh, Judah, uh -huh. Judea, Judah. So why not, why don't you go back to your own... Go back where you belong. Yeah. But God had sent him to Israel. That's right. He was going where God sent him. Mm -hmm. Amazon just refused to accept it. He was not unlike many in our day who object to us speaking as we do among our, they don't object to us speaking as we do among ourselves. Right. Now, if we meet together, we talk about these things this way. They don't have, they don't have any objection. They, they don't object to that. Because when you, when you say it outside, you know, that's what they object to. If you just keep it there, go, go back to your house church, talk about it there. They wouldn't mind that at all. But we're not going to keep it here. God's word is not intended to be bottlenecked in a building. Or a region, or a territory, or a state, or a country. It's not intended to be bottlenecked. Got to be spoken. Eat bread and prophesy there. That is, take it, go back there, live there, and tell those people what you got to say. But he said, don't prophesy in Bethel again. Don't come here again. We don't want to hear you. He didn't even want him to come back for a short term. <laughs> Never again prophesy in Bethel. This is not the place to speak the kind of words Amos was given to speak. But that's where God told him to speak them. So he's going to have to reason like Peter. You, whether we ought to obey God rather than men, you decide. Who should we obey, God or men? Think about it, Amos. This is the king's chapel and court. You're, you're in our most sacred places here. It's the king's sanctuary and it's the royal residence, the New King James Version says. It's the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom, the NIV says. The holy place of the king and the king's house, basic Bible English says. King's sanctuary and national place of worship, New Living Translation says. And the king's sanctuary and the seat of the kingdom, the Amplified said. This why the, Amos, this is the most important place in our country. And here, you, here you are prophesying against this place. And you're talking about our favorite places, the most important place where the king is, is where, the, where our place of worship is. Well, the kind of words Amos spoke didn't fit in with the politics that didn't fit in with the religion. <laughs> They were both, neither one of them, it fit, didn't fit in with either one of them. It constituted an unpleasant interruption to the manner of life they were used to living. When you hear the words of Amos ringing out, it just was like, oh no, not him again, you know. 
and of course the result of being alienated from God. That's, that's what causes that to happen. Yeah. When a person is alienated from God and his thoughts are not their thoughts and his ways are not their ways, that's what produces that shut up mentality. Yeah. That's what does it. Uh, some of you I know have faced similar statements. Speak no more. Don't talk about that anymore. See, what is that? That's a sign to you these people are not of God. Yeah. Amen. That doesn't make any difference how they look. He that is of God hears the words of God. Amen. That's never violated. Some people may have heard them for the first time. But they won't balk at them. They'll, they'll ponder them in their heart. The real people of God. Now you have to do, you have to work this out yourself. Nobody else can do this for you. But you've got to waste as few of your words as possible. When you speak for the Lord, nobody can tell you who to talk to and who not to talk to. But you do have to make a decision on this. Whether you speak, and if you do, what are you going to say? You have to do this. Don't waste your words. Use words God can use. If you're talking to belligerent people, talk to them like God talks to belligerent people. If you're talking to tender-hearted people, talk to them like God talks to tender-hearted people. See? If you're talking to devout, zealous people, talk to them like God talks to them. Yeah. Uh -huh. You probably heard people that are living for God and they get reamed out of the, uh -huh. from the pulpit as though they weren't. Yeah. And you got other people that are living like the devil and they're comforted like they were living for God. Uh -huh. yeah. Use right and holy words. Amen. When it comes to the bold proclamation of what God has said, those who have chosen to live at a distance from God are always, I want to emphasize this, are always offended. Yes. Now, if you can tutor them in drawing closer to God, you have done them a great favor yes. and you've brought great honor to God. Yeah. Yeah. That will involve some reasoning. Uh -huh. Like Paul reasoned with Felix. Uh -huh. I imagine it was gently trying to get him to move in closer. It all happened he didn't. But other people did move in closer. Yes, amen. Really given, this is all part of um, learning to rightly handle the Word of God. That's right. Because this isn't something that just automatically happens. You have to work at this, and yeah. you have to become involved and ask God to help you. And this will, he'll do it, but you're, you're definitely involved in this. Yeah. I think one of the uh, most devastating blows that Satan has dealt to the professed church is the standard approach that applies to everybody. Of course, that's easier. It's easy to learn a thing and mimic it, but this isn't the way Jesus was. This isn't the way the apostles were. This is the way you can, you can be either. You must not be this way. You must speak discreetly and wisely, and you must know how to handle the word of God. Rightly divided means to distribute it yes. appropriately. Uh -huh. yes. To someone that's weeping because of their sin, you don't say, repent. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the wrong thing to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> There's no greater depth to which a mortal can sink than to adopt a religion that rejects the word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, you, that's the lower. You can't go lower than that. That is the bottom rung of the letter. To develop a religion that rejects the word of God. In other words, it's like a vaccine. that It takes a little of the word and inoculates you against the totality of the word. Like you, get, you give a person a little dose of smallpox and it inoculates them against smallpox. That's what's happened. There's places that, yes, you do hear, you do hear some Bible. We don't deny this. But it hasn't done anything in the people. They're inoculated against it. They still don't want very much of it. They still don't want it very often. They still want to maintain their worldly associations. They still want to maintain their preferences. 
Well, it's not because God's word was preached, I'll tell you that. If God's word is preached, they'll either ask the person to leave or they'll open their heart, so does God will open their heart and they'll receive it, one or the other. That's right. That's right. They rejected the word of God for the sake of their traditions. See, nobody knew the Pharisees and scribes were what they really were until Jesus came. No one imagined the scribes and the Pharisees were whited sepulchers. That the outward appearance is as deep as their religion went. But Jesus saw them. Now, you, you can't do that. You, you can't look at people's hearts. But you can deliver the word of God, the right word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it can even distinguish between the soul and the spirit. Amen. It can get in there and do a work. Amen. you got to speak the right word, see? The experience of Amos has become a common experience through history. Don't speak anymore. You remember when the religious leaders, chief priests, and rulers of the temple said to the apostles, first they said to them, let's straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. But let's, let's put a quietus on this. I mean, we are temple dignitaries. They're going to have to pay attention to us because we even have soldiers. Remember those soldiers that arrested Jesus? They are from the chief priest. That's right. They had an army. And they get, then the apostle went out and they preached anyway. Uh -huh. They called him back in and said, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? See? Same thing that Amos encountered. Stop talking about this. But they didn't. They said, well, you're going to have to judge whether we ought to obey God rather than man. You make up the decision. Tell the people that we ought to obey you rather than God. Yeah. Force the issue. Yeah. Yeah. I'm obeying God. I'm not doing this because I hate you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing this because I love God even more than I love you. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. I'm not willing to let you perish without me saying something about it yeah. and offering you a remedy yeah. for the situation. The reasoning undergirding any strategy we have, right, so I'll, let me say a word here about Jesus, the prophets, Jesus, John the Baptist, and the apostles all went first to God's people. Every one of them, the focus of their attention was God's people, and then they went to other people. Now, if, you're a, if you're a Bible student, you already know this is the way it is. But I can show you. I mean, I, you just plot through the book of Acts, and you will be hard-pressed. There are a couple of instances, not many, where someone spoke to a a abject Gentile or a group of abject Gentiles. Doesn't mean they didn't speak to them. I'm what I'm saying. I'm saying that's not where they first went. That was not their priority. Their priority was the people of God. Even with Jesus. That's who he ministered to. That's who John the Baptist ministered to. That's who Paul and Silas ministered to. That's who Paul and Barnabas ministered to. And then they would reach out from there. Why? If a, per, if a church or a group of people or a person makes it their objective to reach centers in remote areas, and we don't condemn anybody for doing this, but where they are here at home is in the slew of sin, they better correct that first. Why? Because when you convert these people, yeah. you're going to transport them into this hodgepodge that you didn't like either. Yeah, right, yeah. And that's what's happened. Yeah, that's right. That is what's happened. Uh -huh. yeah. you remember one time Paul, he was deeply concerned about the church at Corinth. 
because it was probably one of the worst, wor if not the worst church in the Bible, Corinthian church. They were going backward. He was very concerned. He wrote an epistle to him, and he hadn't heard yet from them whether they corrected things or not. When he was in Troas, God opened a great door to him, but he didn't enter into it. He didn't enter into it. And in his second letter to the Corinthians, he told him why he didn't. He says, I was anxious to hear from Titus how things were going. And when you folk get straightened out, then I will preach the gospel to regions beyond. Ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, ho. This is completely different than the reasoning today. Yeah. Yeah. And it's produced a monster yeah. that no man's been able to control. Uh -huh. The premier work of our day is got to be to convert and stabilize the church. Amen. Because no outreach program is going to be as successful as it could be until that's done. Because these people are converted, have to go somewhere. They have to gather with somebody. Unless you develop a group out there, we can I can understand that. In other words, there's a lot of Amaziahs around. And the purpose of God is that we be grounded yes. and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Amen. Now, when you've got a body of people that are grounded and settled, let her fly. <laughs> Send it out and let it fly. But if you haven't, do that first. Stabilize the people. Yes. Veterans know that there are a large number of people that have left America to preach in other places, mm -hmm. specifically because they're not received here. Yeah, they yeah. don't want to be a part of the American church. Yeah, I know. They do not. They come back here only to get money. Yeah, so that they can do the work that they're doing, and and they can't talk about this, mm -hmm. or they'll lose their income. Yeah, they won't be able to preach in other places. Yeah. This is why, this is, this is just some extra for nothing. <laughs> I was talking to some people, foreign people in Africa and in Pakistan. They all have children's ministries. And I'm not against children's ministries, understand. But that's not what's needed. I told them, now listen, there's, there's, I'm going to give you some advice, two things. Number one, do not depend on foreign money to do your work at home. Yeah. Wow. Learn how to work, be enterprising, learn how to bring in money, learn how to work together. Don't depend on outside money to do work at home. Yeah. Uh -huh. And secondly, convert some people that are intelligent people that can take hold of the truth that can step alongside of you and labor with you yeah. stop laboring alone yeah. Yeah. with a whole bunch of kids out there uh -huh. yes. there's people that can do that but it shouldn't be people that can preach the word this is just see the kind of people Paul converted read it read and see what kind of people he converted what kind of people go with him when he was on a trip Hey, it wasn't a bunch of novices, let me tell you. Someone that took hold of things. Why? Because there's Amaziahs. And young converts don't know how to handle Amaziahs. Don't throw them to the dogs. I, I know, I talked to a lot of the young people when I was at school there. They were like thrown to the wolves. And they came back, they'd been gobbled up. And they, they didn't realize what was out there. Nobody told them. I said, all right, this is the situation. But it's not hopeless. I said, this is not hopeless. Yeah. But you just have to know how to enter in to this situation. Yeah. And you're going to have to have a strong faith. But God will help you. If you're determined, God will help you to disrupt the wolves. <laughs> yeah. And snatch some people out of their, snatch the lambs out of their mouths. Yeah. Amen. Huh? Yeah, well, that's all I think I'll say on that. <laughs> and if you have something you'd like to add tonight, 
Yeah, Sister Ada. You started out the evening talking about the dangers of worldly wisdom, and here we see in Jeroboam how uh, turning to worldly wisdom in order to approach God will result in substituting what God has ordained, yes. what God has put in place with religion of a human origin, like what he, what Jeroboam did when he replaced Le, the Levitical line, oh, yeah. right. a priest with yeah. those who were not Levites. Yep. What mm -hmm. business did he have doing that? That's he right. did not respect the authority yeah. of God. Mm -hmm. And today we, we see that worldly wisdom has come up with all kinds of ways to say, this is how you approach God. Mm -hmm. And yet... Uh, it, it has no power in it. Mm -hmm. it Amen. Is, it, it is yeah. rebellion. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm. Judas? When a person proclaims what the Lord has given them and is told to be quiet, that ought to be an exhortation to say it louder and more often. That's right. The blind man recognized this when he called, Son of David, <laughs> have, have mercy thou on me. And somebody told him, hey, be, be quiet over there. Yeah. Be, be quiet. He says, he said it louder. More, yeah. Because he recognized people are listening. Yeah. And if I say it louder, Jesus might be one of them. That's right. Amen. So our view of that has to be if we're speaking the truth and mutually edifying one another and someone tells us to be quiet, say it louder. Yeah. Say it a lot louder because there might there might be people who are listening There's that's my, as a kindred spirit. Or someone who will take what you said and come to Christ because of it. Amen. God's word will get out and we must be fit vessels to carry that out. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let me remind you, everyone, about Bethel. Mm -hmm. Jacob gave the place that oh, name. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And now it's turned into this. That's right. That Amos has to deal with right. now. Mm -hmm. That God has. It used to be the house of God. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just to do it. Yes, when you first began, you were talking about uh, the these men being put in office. Well, the king, by doing that, has cut himself off from any benefit that, that God would minister. That's right. He's rejected God. That's right. And it, because they weren't even of the tribe of Levi. He's already gone against the Lord. Mm -hmm. And these men... They're, they were of the baser sort. These men are not capable of looking after the best interest of the king. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell him whatever will keep their job. Yeah. The Amaziah was looking after Amaziah. Uh -huh. he, he, wasn't, he wasn't really all that concerned with the king, except for as it relates to him keeping his job. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, isn't it, how these characters arise in Scripture yeah. and parallels all, yeah, through yeah. all through history? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for Brother Amos and his ministry. We're grateful that he continued steadfast and unmovable and that we're able to read the account of his prophecy. We pray for boldness, Father, and for wisdom and for them to be wed together so we can speak a word in due season, speak it to the correct people in the correct way so that the Holy Spirit will work. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to be wise and discreet. Help us to pick up on dangerous situations and to be cognizant of opportunities. We pray this in Jesus' name.